every new morning embraced. Every daily tradition continued. Every extra candle lit. Every new challenge accepted. And every obstacle overcome. Every moment is precious. That's why Breakthrough Cancer Research funds research into better, smarter and kinder treatments. Because every breakthrough brings us closer to 100% survival for 100% of cancers. Donate today at BreakthroughCancerResearch.ie Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with This is the Army, Mr. Jones. Every now and then I overhear a friendly argument about who has the hardest job in a family, the man who earns the money or the woman who takes care of the home. I know I should side with the man, and of course most men are working harder today than ever before in their lives. But aren't you ladies doing that too? I'll say you are, and my hat is off to you. With less help and more outside activities and war work, you still have all the family chores, and besides that, you've got to take better care of everything you have to make it last. You can't neglect your cleaning either because dirt wears things out. What you can do is to practice protective housekeeping. Protect your floors, furniture, woodwork with genuine Johnson's Wax. The coat of wax acts as a shield against dirt and wear, guards finishes against scratches and fingerprints. And in the bargain, Johnson's Wax protection saves you hours of work, reduces daily cleaning to a minimum, and adds greatly to the beauty of your home. Isn't it fun to go for a walk in the new fallen snow with the icy wind bringing a tingle to your blood and whipping the roses into your cheeks? Oh, you don't think so? Well, neither do Fibber McGee and Molly. Ah, boy, I'm sure I ain't out in that snow. Whew. <laughs> Glad I'm not out in that snow, I mean. I'll take my flakes made out of corn with cream and sugar. <laughs> You know, I love the first snow of winter myself. You do? Why, sure, you'll have to admit it's beautiful, McGee. Just think, a foot and a half of snow and made of billions and billions of little crystals, yeah. each one a tiny little work of art. Yeah, and you take a handful of them little works of art and sprinkle them on the top step of the porch and wham! <laughs> they carry you inside with a busted clavicle. <laughs> Don't be like that. Now, you haven't any appreciation of nature, dearie. Oh, I have so, too. Nobody gets a bigger honk out of a beautiful sunset than I do. And why? Because right after the sunset comes supper. Well, so what? <laughs> anyway, I'm glad it's stormy and I can't go anyplace. Well, that's fine. Then you can help me clean out the attic. What do you mean, clean out the attic? We just did. When? Why, just let... Well, it was just before... We... Just before Election Day? Yeah. And who got elected? Uh, Roosevelt. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Teddy, but my gosh, the attic can't have Listen, McGee, we've got to do it Molly, uh, I ain't gonna have time Besides, to be Besides, I think I saw your old army uniform up there I don't care, that attic has gone this long and it could... You saw what? I think I saw your old army uniform The one you've been looking for all these years Well, why didn't you say so? Did it have my sharpshooter's medal on it? I didn't notice were you a sharpshooter? Was I a sharpshooter? <laughs> you know what I used to do? What? I used to hold my rifle over my left shoulder with a looking glass in my left hand and knock a cigarette out of a soldier's mouth at 200 yards. Heavenly days. Yeah. Who on earth would volunteer to let you do that? Oh, an old buddy of mine. One ear Coggins. 
<laughs> he was always... You mean the poor lad that only had one ear? How'd he lose the other one? Well, if you must know, even a sharpshooter like me has his off days. <laughs> Come on, let's go up in the attic. Wait a minute now. You better put on some old clothes. It's pretty dusty up there. My old clothes don't fit me anymore. I tried on those old green pants of mine this morning, and I split the whole seat out of them. McGee, you didn't have any green pants. Huh? Those were my new slacks. <laughs> they were? Yes, and they cost me seven ninety five too. Oh, McGee. Oh, well, okay, okay. I'm sorry. But that's what women get for wearing trousers. There was a time when a man knew what was his and what was his wife's. <laughs> now, if he dresses in the dark, he's lucky if he don't get whistled at by the guys in front of the cigar. Just the same, dearie. I'm yes, in favor. It used to be in your sweet little Alice blue gown, and now it's in your baggy old Harris tweed slacks. <laughs> My slacks are not baggy, McGee. Well, maybe yours aren't, but did you ever see Mrs. Uppington in hers? <laughs> she looks like she was walking around sitting down. <laughs> now, let's go up in the attic and get it cleaned up. Oh, for goodness sakes, I wonder who's out on a day like this. Must be some friend of ours. I don't know any strangers that silly. <laughs> Come in. Oh, hello there, little girl. Oh, hello there, dear. McGee, now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going up in the attic. You come up as soon as you can. I'll be right up, Molly, just as soon as I get rid of... Uh, I'll be right up. What's on your mind, sis? Hey, there's a dandy lot of snow out now, mister, and I thought maybe you'd want to pull me on my sled, hmm, will you, hmm, will you, hmm? No, no. <laughs> no, I won't. You couldn't get me out of the house today with dynamite. You mean you won't pull me on my sled? No. Don't you like little children? Yes. Yes, I do, but I'm very fond of my health, too. Oh. The only time I want to play on the ice now is when my upper lip coasts down a cold cube in a tall, tall glass of root beer. <laughs> you catch on? According to my daddy, you're going to play outdoors a lot this winter, I bet you. And stop quoting your old man at me, too. He was born dumb, and he's been losing ground ever since. <laughs> You can't talk that way about my daddy. He's a nice man. Well, you're the one who brought him up, and he's the one who brought you up, and two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> anyway, how does he know how much I'm going to play outside? I don't know, but after he heard your last couple of programs, he said, boy, that mug is going to have some hard sledding this winter. <laughs> oh, ho, he said that, did he? Sure. <laughs> but I don't think he meant it. You don't? No, he looked awful happy when he said it. Now look, too little and too late. I haven't got time to stand around and rattle a cup with you. Now, so go on home. Beat it. I'm busy. What you doing? I'm hmm? going to clean out the attic. Mrs. McGee just found my old army uniform up there from the last war. Oh, gee. Were you in the last war, mister? Were you a general? <laughs> well, no, I wasn't. Though if it hadn't been for petty politics... Ah, oh, but that's a long story. <laughs> you know what General Pershing said to me when I asked him to make me a captain? No. Who told you? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> now, look, sis, you drop in some other time and I'll show you my sharpshooter's medal. All righty. Gee, I never knew you had a sharpshooter's medal, well, mister. Well, I have. What'd you get it for? What'd you... Doggone it, I got it for sharpshooting. I used to hit the bullseye 99 times out of 100. Oh, didn't it hurt him? <laughs> hurt who? The bull. There wasn't any bull to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. 99 times out of 100? Oh, no. So long, mister. <laughs>
Oh, just look at this attic, McGee. Did you ever see so much junk? What do you mean, junk? There's a lot of valuable stuff in this junk. Hey, where'd you see my old uniform? Isn't that right uh, there behind you? Huh? Isn't that it there? Well, I'll be... It sure is. <laughs> oh, look. Here's where I tore the knee climbing into a truck outside of St. Nazaire. Oh. Yes, sir. Here's where a bayonet went through the shoulder. Heavenly days, McGee. Yeah. In a hand-to-hand fight? No, on a dark road. <laughs> I stumbled and fell on my Springfield. <laughs> And here's my sharpshooter's medal. Did I ever tell McGee, you... Huh? you never told me you were in the Air Force. I wasn't. Well, then what are those wings on the left breast of your coat? Where? I don't see any... Oh. Oh, that. That's a moth. Shoot. Scratch. Get out. <laughs> oh, look, McGee. Here's a newspaper from September 3rd, 1922. 20 years ago. Hmm. And listen to this headline. German printing presses pour out 100 billion marks every day. Why were they printing all that money, McGee? Inflation. <laughs> Terrible mess. In Germany, after the last war, it took a bushel basket of money to buy a pair of shoestrings. If anybody had the shoes to put them in. Heavenly <laughs> days. Does every war do that? <clears throat> it don't have to. That's why the government wants us to buy war bonds and pay off our debts and buy only what we need. If they keep things under control... Then after the war, our money will really be worth something. Hey, do something for me, will you, Molly? What? Save that headline. Every time I start yipping about taxes, wave it in my face. <laughs> it's a promise. Every time... What do you got there? Bunch of old letters in the bottom of this trunk. Oh, here's one from my granduncle Jefferson. Oh, my. I ain't heard of that old snarly old coot for years and years and years. <laughs> Is it addressed to you? Well, no, it says, To whomsoever in the McGee family it may concern. <laughs> I guess that's me as much as anybody. Here, you read it. Stingy old twerp must have wrote it with a toothpick in homemade ink. Oh, it's probably nothing. McGee, huh? listen to this. Huh? It says, should any of my descendants read this note, this is to inform them that I have concealed $20,000 in the upholstery of my horsehair sofa. My gosh, 20000 bucks. If this letter is never found, it won't matter much, because no McGee could ever be trusted with more than $3 at a time. <laughs> Signed Jefferson McGee, August 13th, 1867. Why, that dirty old $20,000. And who knows where that old sofa is now? You know, that's funny. I wrote a note just a day or so ago about a horsehair sofa. What? You did? Where? Oh, my gosh, Molly. Uh, maybe we can find it. What'd you write? What is it? Where, oh, where'd you... Oh, ah, calm yourself. I'm thinking now. Let me see. Where did I... I think I had it in the desk downstairs. Well, what are we waiting for? Come on, hurry up now. Here, quit pushing me. You go through that desk with a fine tooth comb, Molly. If we can only trace that horse there sofa, we'll be rich. I look for it, McGee, but I'm not sure what it said about a sofa, and maybe it wasn't even the same sofa. Oh, you think the McGee's ever had two horse hair sofas? No, sir. We were strictly a one horse family. <laughs> come on, come on, Molly. Get well, busy. Stop dun- nudging me. I'm looking here. Now let me see. Oh, Dad, Red. Come in. Oh, hello, Mr. Mayor. Oh, good day, Mrs. McGee. Hello, McGee. You look excited. Uh, I am excited, Latrivia. Uh, I'm an heiress. <laughs> I just come in to 20,000 bucks from my granduncle Jefferson. No, 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 you haven't, McGee. Huh? First, I have to find that note I wrote, and then we have to locate the sofa, if it's the same one, and then we have to see if the money is still in it. Good heavens, what is this all about? Why did he leave the money in a sofa? Because he knew a McGee would spend most of his life lying down, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> he never knew any such a thing, Latrivia. He wanted it to be discovered by a McGee with initiative, with brains, ingenuity, and enough interest in him to read the letters he left behind him, which I did. Which you did nothing of the kind. You refused to read it. Well, could I help it if I had tears in my eyes? <laughs> Poor old granduncle Jeff. You realize, I hope, McGee, that the possession of wealth entails certain responsibilities? Yes, you've got to live up to it, McGee. I know. Now, when a panhandler asks you for a cup of coffee, don't just give him a dime. Go with him and see where he gets it and get me shot. <laughs> First thing I'm going to do is endow the Elks Club. Oh, my. Going to stake them to a new deck of cards. <laughs> that pack they're using now are so worn, the kibitzers can't read them over your shoulder anymore. They have to sit in your lap. <laughs> that isn't what I was referring to, McGee. I meant that riches bring obligations to the possessor. Oh. You must set an example to those who are not so well off. Help the underdog. Oh, he loves dogs, don't you, dear? Uh, I'll say I do. I'm going to get me a nice Irish setter pup. I didn't mean real dogs, McGee. Well, I was referring... how can you help a dog if he isn't real, Mr. McGee? I was referring to people, Mrs. McGee. Oh, people have... so 
you think people are dogs, do you, Latrivia? A fine altitude. I didn't say people were dogs. I merely said that I, as a leader of the people... Oh, now, think... calm yourself, Mr. Mayor. We can't have the leader of the people turning purple. I am not turning people. I mean purple. I started to say that as a pup, a per... I mean a person, I pup... He's got the pip. I've got the pip. I have not! I was trying to say that if a pupson, uh, a person, wants to be a pup, uh, popular, he'll probably, uh, probably... <laughs> Excuse me if I go out on the porch. I think I have a flea. <laughs> you know, Molly, on second thought, I won't buy that Irish setter Latrivia was trying to sell me. <laughs> I'd rather have a good Springer. A Springer you is a... You can't buy a hot dog till you find that money, McGee. Oh, I'll find it, and that dough is rightfully mine, too. That horsehair sofa was in our house in Peoria for years. And what became of it? I don't know. Kids divided up the furniture. I remember all I got was a lot of old pictures. Must have been 50 of them. I threw them away. Too old-fashioned. Who painted them? Oh, a couple of amateurs named Courier and Ives or something like that. <laughs> Corny stuff. I see. So you threw away 50 Courier and Ives prints. Yeah, but I was no fool. I saved the frames. <laughs> <laughs> Kept us in kindling wood for months. Hey, you better get busy and find that note you wrote. Yes, I wish I could remember just what I... Now, let me see now. Horsehair sofa, horsehair sofa. Hello, folks. Am I intruding? Oh, not a bit, Mr. Wilcox. Come right in. Hi, Wilcox. Don't worry about tracking snow in here. We're moving very shortly. Moving? Where to? Don't look at me, Mr. Wilcox. It isn't my idea. We'll probably take a penthouse in New York, Wilcox. For the winter season, anyway. Possibly a few months at Virginia Hot Springs. Then we may summer in the White Mountains or Lake Louise. <laughs> I hope you can visit us for a weekend, old fellow. Get in some golf, you know. <laughs> uh, pardon me for pointing, but do you feel all right? <laughs> well, he's a bit ho uh, seasick, Mr. Wilkins. <laughs> His dreamboat is a little rocky. <laughs> oh, come, come, Mrs. McGee. Let us not let us maintain our dignity. <laughs> In our juxtaposition, we must not descend to bantying words with the tradesmen. That's you, Mr. Wilcox. You're the tradesman. Take it from there. Hey, what goes on here anyway? Don't give me that Park Avenue pick a lily fibber. I knew you when you thought a country club was a hole. Up, <laughs> up now. None of your impotence, my good man, or I shall have to report to you to your superiors. The, uh... Henderson Mott Company of Sheboygan, I believe. S.C. <laughs> Johnson and Son Incorporated, McGee, of Racine, Wisconsin. Oh, yes. Make a note of that, Mrs. McGee. Report of insolent employee. Hey, what is this? You know darn well who we work for, and you know they make self-polishing glow coat, the protective floor polish that shines as it dries. I believe I have heard some. Oh, you've heard it plenty, brother, and you'll hear it some more. You'll keep on hearing that Johnson self-polishing glow coat protects and preserves linoleum against dust and dampness. And that it saves hours of housework because it eliminates old-fashioned floor scrubbing. And you'll I hear that... I say, old man, is it quite necessary to be so beastly raucous? Oh, so now I'm raucous. I'm an insolent, raucous tradesman, am I? Well, I don't know what this is all about. But something tells me there's going to be a new face around here. I wonder what Ed Wynn is doing now. <laughs> Didn't you overdo that a little, McGee? After all, you're not rich yet, you know. Ah, but I soon will be. That 20,000 bucks is just as good as in my pocket right this minute. Look, uh, dearie, whoever that is at the door, let's not say a thing about the $20,000. Okay, maybe the less we say about it, the better. Come in. Oh, hello, Mrs. Uppington. Uh, how do you do, Mrs. McGee? And Mrs. McGee. Hi, Uppy. Beautiful day, ain't it? Uh, definitely not, Mr. McGee. It's horrible. The snow has drifted clear up to... Your clavicle, Uppy? <laughs> oh, no, that can't be right, because your clavicle is your collarbone. <laughs> You'll have to excuse him, Abigail. Clavicle is the only bone he knows the name of. <laughs> well, I understand, Mrs. McGee. Anyway, I was merely going to say that the snow was way up past my spare tire. <laughs> well, keep walking in the snow and you'll lose that, Uppy. McGee... <laughs> So the snow is really pretty deep, is it, Abigail? Oh, it's dreadful, my dear. But I felt that I should come over to ask you to return my snow shovel. My houseman informs me that Mr. McGee has had it since last winter. Why, sure. Tell him to come and get it any time, Uppy. 
Of course, he'll have to sign for it in triplicate. <laughs> when I borrow things, I do it systematic. <laughs> you know, you look like you enjoyed being out in this weather, Abigail. Oh, I, I don't really mind it, my dear. I'm a trooper, you know. And as an actress who has traveled from coast to coast... Incidentally, I... Abby, uh, did you know the Cherry Sisters? Oh, they were my dearest... No, of course not. <laughs> that was much before my time. Oh. Though my father probably knew them. He was connected with the stage for many years. He was? Oh, sure he was, Molly. He drove it between here and the county seat till the <laughs> railroad comes through. <laughs> And who, may I ask, told you that? Oh, I heard. Oh. Well, I... What's the matter, Abigail? Are you cold? You're shivering. No, Mrs. McGee, I am not cold. I was being shaken by the conflict between my patriotism and my impulses. What do you mean, Abby? I mean, Mr. McGee, that in spite of this being a meatless day, I was sorely tempted to give you a few chops with the handle of my umbrella. Oh, goodbye. <laughs> The King's Men Sing Abraham Upon a February morn A little baby boy was born Twasn't Henry, twasn't Sam Twas Abraham Right He grew up this little babe Folks all called him Honest Abe Folks from Maine to Alabama Loved Abraham And now he's in the Hall of Fame, a most respected gent. That is why we celebrate this blessed February date. Abraham, honest Abraham. The USA's united thanks to one whose name was Nancy Hanks. Abraham. Oh, Abraham. He gave this land the finest son who ever went to Washington. Abraham. thousand divided by with a surtax of four percent on top of the secondary bracket that'll be sixteen thousand seven hundred minus the accrued interest and in investments plus depreciation oh my gosh hey molly yes McGee. you know what my income tax on that twenty thousand bucks is going to be what seventy four thousand six hundred and seventy two dollars <laughs> I'm going to be worse off than I was before. I wish you could find that note, so... Oh, that, that, come in. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, Mr. McGee. Oh, hello, Mr. Wendell. <laughs> Terrible weather, isn't it? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. McGee. I really don't mind the snow. I find it rather inspiring. <laughs> me too, Imp. It inspires me to stay inside with my slippers on. <laughs> I think he means poetically, dearie. Don't you, Mr. Wimple? Yes, Mrs. McGee. I love to sit in the park on a snow, snow, snowy day and feed the squirrels and think up poems. <laughs> Have you batted out any beautiful ballads of late, Wimp? I just wrote one this afternoon, Mr. McGee. I call it To My Dear Wife. Oh. <laughs> Sweet. Must be wonderful to have a husband who writes poetry to you. What do you mean, it must be? I used to write poetry to you. I know, dearie, but that was free verse. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Did Mr. McGee write free verse, Mrs. McGee? Yes. He took it freely from Longfellow, Byron, and Burns. <laughs> well, he was a great poet, that Byron. I still think he should have been president. Oh, he couldn't have been, Mr. McGee. He was an Englishman. What are you talking about? Williams Jennings Byron was an Englishman? <laughs> Skip it, McGee. I want to hear Mr. Wimple's poem to his dear wife. How does it go, Mr. Wimple? Oh, it's just a simple little thing, Mr. Wimple. It goes to my dear wife. <clears throat> I wish I was a little squirrely. Well, that wish is granted, Wimple. 
We've got two more coming. Quiet, McGee. <laughs> Go on, Mr. Wimple. I wish I was a little squirrely, frisking in a tree so early, chattering down at passerbys and throwing pigs down in their eyes. <laughs> Scampering gaily here and there, leaping gracefully through the air, storing food up three whole seasons to last through winter and other reasons, every one of which I often brewed, so when I climb down to dig up food and bring back breakfast to my wife so true, I can say, here, sweetheart, nuts to you. <laughs> That's, that's very good, ma'am. How's your wife like it, Mr. Wimple? Sweetie face? Oh, I haven't shown it to her, Mrs. McGee. Besides, she isn't much for modern poetry. She likes limericks. Ever write her any limericks, Wimp? <clears throat> oh, I started to once. I wrote, There once was a woman named Sweetie Face whose figure had many a meaty place. <laughs> well? Yes, I am now. <laughs> but I was laid up for weeks and weeks. Well, goodbye now. Goodbye, Mr. <laughs> McGee, I'm going to take one more look through that desk and see if I can't find that note I wrote. Well, if that fails, I'm going to wire all my relatives and see what become of that horsehair sofa. Might be a good idea. Maybe they'll... McGee, here it is. I found it. Oh, what does it say? What does it say? What does it say? Oh, shut it off. Shut it off. Stop shaking my arm. Huh? Listen. Yeah? It says... How about new slip cover for a horsehair sofa? Yeah, but what does that mean? I don't it see it. It means this is that horsehair sofa right here. Uh -huh. I got a silly one. Remember, I made this slip cover four years ago. Oh. This is the sofa that was sent from Peoria. Oh, my gosh. You mean I'm at sitting right on top of 20,000 bucks? <laughs> Give me my jackknife. Quick. Mickey, I'll soon find don't out. cut it to pieces. Take it apart carefully, and then we can... Carefully, my clavicle. I gotta know, and I gotta know quick. I'll fix it. Oh. I'll show old Uncle Jeffy. Mickey, stop. Here it is. Look. Wow. Look at that stack of dough. Oh, oh, Mama, we're rich. Hey, Molly, we're rich. Here, take a handful. <laughs> take two handful. <laughs> Hot diggity. Tonight we go out and paint the town red. Tonight we celebrate. Ah, <laughs> good old Uncle Jeff. <laughs> What's the matter, Molly? Is there something wrong? McGee. Huh? Where was your grand Uncle Jefferson from? Richmond, Virginia. Why? <laughs> Nothing. Except this is Confederate money. <laughs> what? Why, that dirty, sour puss <laughs> Right this minute, in thousands of closets and attics across the country are leather suitcases and handbags and other luggage that all need the same thing, a coat of wax. Have you tried putting a coat of Johnson's wax on a suitcase recently? Then you'll know what I mean. Remember how the leather seemed to take on new life and resilience as well as better appearance? Yes, the wax does protect the leather and helps to keep it from drying out. In fact, most leather objects benefit by an occasional waxing with Johnson's Paste or Liquid Wax. Boots and shoes, for example, book covers, briefcases, straps, belts, and purses. And by the way, when you're through using the bottle or can of Johnson's Wax, don't forget to put the lid back on tightly. That will prevent evaporation and help keep the wax in best condition. You know, Molly, I don't regret losing that 20,000 bucks. No? What could I have done with it? Buy clothes, they go out of style. Buy diamonds, they get stolen. <laughs> Buy a yacht, it sinks. <laughs> what good would it be? For $20,000, you can buy a wonderful steak. What kind of a steak would be worth 20,000 bucks? A steak in our country, McGee. War bonds. Oh, oh, yes. Good night. Good night, all. The part of Wallace Wimple heard on this program was played by Bill Thompson. This is Marla Wilcox speaking for the makers of Johnson's Black Finishes for the home and industry. We invite you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.